chairs of the various thesis committees and as guests to speak to us about their take on the thesis experience and passive. So uh, today we've got Craig Buckman. Welcome. Good to be here. So all the way from uh, the West Coast. Just got here. Oh my God. <laughs> no, uh, walking across the hall of it. <laughs> <laughs> but I uh, appreciate uh, Professor White inviting me and uh, having these dialogues. I think it's a good, a good thing that we're doing, I think. Uh, uh, probably something that uh, hopefully will benefit you guys as you go forward. Maybe uh, have a couple things I want to talk about before I do that. Maybe I can plug into maybe where you guys, just a quick, quick overview, obviously, of kind of what uh, you guys have been discussing and maybe how I can enhance that. Somehow. Well, lately in here, we've been, uh, first of all, every Monday, two of them give a progress report, just sort of in-house. And we have kind of a round table set of comments and uh, suggestions there. And then when there aren't guests here, um, the latest chalk talks have been on uh, the two pressure points in the thesis. One is the, uh, the choice of topic and the scholarship of pushing into the topic and taking the topic apart to produce something that's architecturalizable. And then the second one is the application or the, the manifestation of the research in some form. Most of these guys are picking buildings. Mm -hmm. And um, the last session we had was on the various inputs into the process. We diagram the, the inputs and the process of conceptualizing and transforming and mm -hmm. moving into to physical form. And then that generated generic question types that can give them ways of talking about it when they're done. Mm -hmm. Because the conclusions need to have some reflection when they're finished. So. Um, and, and that might be the most important part, you know. Of it. So maybe picking up on that, maybe, you know, we could say, uh, let's say that we'll use the, the phrase the building, although we know it might be more than that parts of buildings, components of buildings, ensembles of buildings, but we'll say the building. So the building is really a means to something else. You know, this is the question. So the, the thesis ultimately is about going through that process, which a lot of things that feed into this, to go into that process to get at something else, and that is not the conventional process we use in undergraduate or doing other design projects. So we'll circle back to that. Um, some, of the, some of the things I've put on the board, you may have heard before from various professors, Professor White, but it helps because every time I, I draw it, I understand it better. <laughs> because, it's, it, because it's important. And we'll do it as a diagram. So the way I think about what you're doing, and the left and right doesn't matter. Um, let's just say that this is a, a design discourse or a design um, process. We're going to call it discourse. And this is a research discourse. Now, I, I think, for me, I think for a lot of us here, we put design as a way of thinking or a way of acting as kind of the umbrella for both of those. I think that's completely fine. But, but I'm going to divide a little bit more and say that this is about making, okay, and this is about finding, you know, or for discovery. And they're obviously related. Now, what tends to happen, because uh, you're, first of all, it's probably the first time you've done this, and in and, and this depth of the process, this lot of the time. And second, it's, it's a lot to do, you manage, uh, in a relatively short time frame, in order to be, have a really successful thesis, you know, where it's in depth, where it's comprehensive, where it's just, 
they on all cylinders. So what happens often is, you know, you're, you're going through your research, you're going, doing your document, your literature, your review, discussion with the professor, discussion with the peers, gleaning the essential um, items. We're going to call that, um, let's call it the standards. The standards by which you're going to judge and what's going to feed into this. And those standards might be idea based and then they're often a combination or performance based. And, and they're often a, you know, a blending of those. But um, we'll talk about the difference in, in these. And I think at least the students I'm working with we're dealing more with idea-based pieces. But even when you have an idea-based standard from your research, there should be, well not should be, there's got to be some accountability. There's got to be where, where this, okay, this is uh, design, we call it application, the test, you know, whatever we want to call it, the, the building, I'm not going to write that. Um, so what often happens is this goes and goes and goes, and then you jump into this, and you do it at the end, and they never really come together. They never really begin to have a dialogue with each other, because in, in, in the design thesis, an architectural thesis, this has to begin to inform this just as much as this informs that, right? I mean, design is a way of knowing too. It's a way of making, and I'm going to come back talk about that, but it's also a way of finding. So these guys have to really inform each other and, and become a synthesis you know, it, it leads to, you know, the conclusion or kind of, you know, what, we, what we've learned. Um, so this is the design, but the design's different from previous, previous projects in that you're not solving a specific design problem. You're not, you know, uh, fitting in this building on the site in this type of urban lot, or you're not, you know, designing a, uh, this sports facility necessarily at this this uh, this school, and that's it. And how well did you do that? But it's as Tim said before, you go through the process, and what did you learn, and how much did that inform yourself and inform the the top? How much did it, it, it push forward that particular topic you're looking into? So let me circle back to this what I call making as a part of design. I think each one of us, in our own way, when we, we take the research, we take the knowledge, we, we take our interest, and you become more informed from what you've been doing, and maybe it's the first step or the, the first sequence before you actually design stuff, design the building, you start making something. Those things you make might be in the form of um, Sketches, it might be in small study models, it might be, uh, you know, in, in uh, a series of diagrams, but something beyond words because it's an architectural discourse. You know, we're not getting the literature, it's not a literature thesis, it's not a creative writing thesis, it's an architectural thesis. So I think we need to make something, and it'd be a building, so we have to make something. Now, this is a student um, last year, and her thesis was on uh, time in architecture. She started looking at all these different types of time, you know, cyclical time, linear time, local time, global time, uh, uh, the duration of concept of time is a little bit, um, oh, the duration of concept versus duration of events, and objective time, and there's others, you know, there's diachronic and synchronic time, so on and so forth. So she began to understand that 
you know, the way we look at time is just one particular version of that. You know, you can measure time in a number of ways, and some cultures and societies don't really measure time at all, except for celestial time. They don't necessarily divide it into hours and seconds and minutes. So, a way for her to understand in an architectural um, situation um, those different ideas of time, she made these little models. You know, this obviously begins to be a time piece, like a, um, a sundial, uh, marching time, um, folded time, chaotic time, so on and so forth. But she chose little planes of uh, cardboard, museum board, and she chose the little plastic screens. So these were conscious decisions about making. So you begin to then, I'll come back to what this is, begin to, you know, fold this into, you know, your research and begin to synthesize these, these two discourses. The other thing she chose, this is more about site and application. She chose an existing library building in Jacksonville because she wanted to add something new to something old, and therefore that was important to her study so that, you know, there was time past, time future. It wasn't just something she was uh, doing to a particular building or site uh, now in the present, but it dealt with something that existed in the past. Of course, everything exists in the past, but she wanted particular building uh, to, to relate to in that respect. And this, um, what she called experimental time, was the one that she she chose to bring forward, and, and there's a whole other series of boards that take this into a lot more detail. And there was a lot more to the research in this, but it, it just showed that this is important because it's not so much building to a point with your application, but the research took her to a whole range of possibilities. Okay? And he may have done this, I don't know. But, but what I liked about this and her other advisors was that she had one, two, three, four, five, six, she had eight possibilities to then you know, take forward and she, she chose one of them. So, so the research uh, and, and the, the act of making began to feed in and make it really more of a design thesis uh, so that it was, uh, to me, kind of positive in, in the School of Architecture. I'll look at maybe another example. Because I think there's all different types of successful um, thesis projects at the end of the day. There's, there's not just one kind. Like I said, some tend to be more idea based, some tend to be more performance based, or some are a combination, and that's fine. I'll share two with you, or two processes that I think were successful thesis. Uh, in past uh, projects. Um, firstly, the performance-based one, it kind of emphasizes that. It's pretty straightforward. There was a student that uh, was interested in, uh, in acoustics and acoustic environments of buildings and relationship between sound and space and, and shape and concave and convex form and, uh, and uh, sound, sound waves. So these are just little plan diagrams. Simplifying it. But this is like the, the house, this is the stage, stage, house, seats, of oh, house, and here, the stage. And he did, you know, a bunch of research on acoustic performance and music and reverberation and uh, time sequences of rever reverberation, um, soft versus medium, which is hard surface, a lively room, lively wall versus a soft wall. The resonance of wood versus the resonance of uh, other materials, the different species of wood, you know, spruce, species of sound signature, you know, oak gives you that, so on and so forth. Um, but the geometry, the, the, the architectural vessel was the main thing he was looking at. So, you know, he, he found this uh, uh, software that, that modeled acoustic performance and based on, you know, of a play or a 
bird performance has different uh, requirements than a musical or orchestra or opera. So he chose uh, orchestra and, uh, and jazz. And anyway, he did these three studies. He did the, his physical models, his digital models, section, plan, volume, perspective, uh, dimensions, proportions, and modeled them with the software and came to a conclusion. And uh, I think at first she thought that this kind of, uh, of course you don't want parallel wall of any kind of musical performance. Um, he, he had a hypothesis, hypothesis this might be the best before. And I think the one that was kind of crenellated and diffused sound energy where I, where I still bouncing it at certain time signatures, this one came out to be the best. Okay. So, okay, great. Good job. He researched all of this, found out about it, said, I want to test that in this, this design exercise, but did it in depth, you know, a lot more than three diagrams. Had it fully documented, had the uh, software to kind of uh, calculate, you know, there's, there's a performance issue here. Uh, performance and said, well, I thought it was going to be this one, but you know what? It was that one. So he, he advanced the knowledge of that, and he learns a lot. He learned something about it, and the the, the uh, reviewers and the audience learned something as well. And so that's that's really more performance-based thesis. Now you might say. There's not too much making or design with the or art with or design with a capital D there. And I would say um, if you saw them, they looked pretty, pretty compelling. And they did have an artfulness to them. And I would say, no, there is. As soon as you make something, that's inherent in the design process. That wasn't the focus, the idea base, performance was the focus, but there were still a level of design uh, in in the, uh, the the making side, design discourse of his thesis. Another one was uh, let me drop this. Okay, this is this kind of curving plastic serpentine wall, and it's you know. Like seven stories high. And then here is uh, a, a wall, it's uh, a curtain wall that's, that's like a truss, it seems to be kind of a space frame. So you have this, you know, here's your floors, and you just attach to, you know, this kind of block behind it. So you have this kind of skeletal thing is hanging on this, this block. Okay, so we call this, we call this plastic form. We'll call this constructivist. This is tectonic. This is a system of joints and members, assembly. This is carved, this is sculpted, this, this is plastic. Okay, now as a whole, Tradition, we can go back to look at the research of the evolution of these you know, different ways, different ways of, of, of making things. This application happens to be on an urban building that's seven, not ten floors high, with certain orientation and certain other contextual situations, so on and so forth. So we can go back to say, well, this may have started way back in antiquity, but we know at least in the 20th century. There were the Italian uh, futurist sculptors, sculptures. Okay, then we, we kind of uh, fast forward a little bit. There's Eric Mendelssohn, German architect, his famous Einstein Tower. Then we go forward, and there was kind of late Corbu and some Marcel Breuer. And if we fast forward all the way to today, we definitely have Zaha Hadid. <coughs> and I wouldn't put Gary 
in this, because to me, he's doing something else. Uh, but it's related. And with the parametric modeling and with the digital tools we have now, this is this is forward. This has gone further into you know people like uh, you know, studies from the BMW headquarters by uh, uh, Unstudio or uh, Ben Ben Burkle and, and and many others. In this tradition, as we have the Russian constructivists originally. Then it continues on through, uh, uh, you know, Mies van der Rohe, on through the eight, Charles Henry Eames, on to the, the British high-tech architects, in particular, Richard Roderick, Roger Nicholas Grimshaw, and Renzo Piano. And so this, this tradition, you know, we'll say Rogers, Piano, Grimshaw, and many others, but there's some of the leading proponents proponent of practice. So, you know, the Pompidou Center in Paris being a great example. So two completely different notions of design, construction, materiality, assembly, performance, expression, so on and so forth. Uh, one could then, you know, research all of this, choose an application, uh, explore it and model it both ways, in, in, in a fairly detailed way, you know, uh, you have to get into a lot of design detail, investigations with both hand, digital models, uh, expression, you know, investigations at the detail level, investigations at, at the pure aesthetics of the two expressions, investigations in a comprehensive way in terms of what each of these languages leads to. Now, there's obviously a, a performance side, there's obviously a technology side, but I think, you know, more than that, it's, it's an idea of a particular way that someone wants to express and create form and space at an architectural scale, at an architectural application. And another student who worked on this, their interest was really more about the, I, the, the, you know, how would these different uh, methodologies or languages, that's a better word, how did these different languages lead to expression? You know, what, what was the, the expressive potency of each of these languages? So in that sense, it's both performance and idea-based, but I think the ideas were more about, you know, architectural uh, space and expression and, and, and it might be the idea of lightness. It might be the idea of joinery. It might be the idea of, um, yeah, but Mr. Fuller would also be on this side. This idea of, uh, you know, this kind of ephemeral uh, uh, way to, to create structural armatures and enclosures with as little material as possible. Where this is in the more the tradition of of the handmade, of the carved, of, of the ceramic, uh, you know, kind of uh, origins of, of, of working with clay and working with concrete, and now working through digital media um, to uh, uh, also uh, Antonio Gaudi would be on this side, you know. So all of those those uh, those lineages of expression would come to bear uh, on this thesis, and and the great thing about a thesis would be. In, in a design project, you're going to have to choose. You're going to, you're going to, unless you do two design projects, you could. But the thesis, we're going to focus just on this edge, just on this curtain wall, or just on this surface of this building. And, and we're going to do both systems. We're going to do both languages. And then we're going to come to a conclusion, and we're going to compare the two. We're going to talk about the, the differences. We're going to talk about the benefits, the pros, the cons, the uh, the different limitations and the different advantages each approach has. So it's still you still work to a conclusion. You still work to um, a set of, of lessons that you can extract in design and the the research, which is really your standards. A lot of times we'll say to students, 
how did how's your research informing your design? You know, how's your research informing? You're going to hear that probably, you know, so you hear in your sleep. How's your research informing your design? But I would I would say also it's just as important to say how's your design informing your research? You, know, you have to ask that question as well. And so you have to start this early enough so that you're just, it's not just this this thing here hanging out here by itself that that doesn't really connect to to the real goal of getting to these really informed and, and thoughtful conclusions. So we'll maybe go from there. <laughs> now and each of these guys is far enough along with their uh, their design of their question and their inquiry to, to hopefully generate some questions about what the correct said here. Question. Which is more important, the process or the application for the cases? Well, uh, if you ask it that way, I would say the, the process is more important. Uh, because I think you can choose a lot of different applications and if your process is a really thoughtful one and um, an engaged one, I think you'll have a good result. That's not to say the application is, that you choose is not important. It is important to really think about, you know, it needs to kind of make sense on a certain level and it needs to be something that seems to be a natural fit with the research. Um, you know, it, or it may, we were talking to me the other day, as a white and I, you might choose something intentionally where you would think that the research and the topic you're looking at and the application you chose, that seems to be almost in conflict with one another. It seems to almost be like, well, how are you going to pull that off? But if you chose an application still in a thoughtful way, then, then the, the position then is you're intentionally choosing an application that on the surface looks like it's going to be extremely difficult or it's not going to be a natural fit. But you're, you're going to not just going to blind, blindly plow through, but you're going to thoughtfully let the research inform that application and see if it can work in maybe a non-traditional way. And see, see maybe, maybe that research is not to be broad. I mean, this is think out loud. There's all kinds of things now, obvious things about, say, bringing natural settings or biophilic design to uh, healthcare settings. That, that seems so natural now. Yeah, people look at some trees, and, some, and, and, and the sun setting, it makes them feel better, okay? It's a no-brainer. But maybe you bring, um, uh, I, I don't know, you know, something like um, some type of, uh, you know, theatrical performance or some other type of discourse that seems to not make sense in healthcare, but maybe, maybe it would, you know? At the end of the day, you may say, no, it, makes, it didn't make any sense, I didn't think it would. But maybe it does, and you never know if you try. Um, I have to question because suppose you have the application and you're, you're searching, so the, 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 <coughs> the, the, the longer research which would determine the application, but you already have the application and you're researching stuff that will affect the space. Mm -hmm. So no. that's why I asked the question: is which is more important, the, the research or the, or the application? Well, I, I think the the process of the application, the execution of it, is just as important as the research. I feel it's equally important. Um, the the choice of the application is 
matters, but may not matter as much as the way you go about it. So I'm not showing the cards. You're not. You're not telling him here the story that you've got under the table here. She's working with Arlene, <laughs> uh, and Arlene said, "Look, most theses you choose a topic that you're interested in, and then you find an application that fits." Mm -hmm. She talked with Kimona about finding a project which generates research issues that have to be looked at. Mm -hmm. So it's a reversal. Mm -hmm. And so in your case, you began with a problem mm -hmm. in, uh, in Jamaica, right? Mm -hmm. Which generates issues which have to be looked at to solve that problem. So in her case, it was it's reversed. I think that's completely fine. I really, I, I think every, I think everything runs two ways. <laughs> There's a head to every tail, a tail to every head. Models need to be turned upside down. Sometimes they work better when you put them that way. Uh, I think that's completely fine. I just think it's a matter of, you know, making sure that issues that come out of that application, research issues, are compelling and, and, and have enough depth to to really, you know, kind of meet to be a, a good piece. What other questions does the group have? Thinking about your own particular task and whether you can take this in and make your sense out of it with your own. I mean, this is all really pretty straightforward stuff, but is everybody kind of under yeah. any questions about this? Yeah. Makes sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think your two examples were more helpful to show what you mean by an idea-driven thesis. Yeah. And, and really, that second one, I think, is really kind of in the middle kind of between idea and, and, and performance. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I, I can only say because I'm working with Tanisha as well, I'll speak about yours. I think his investigation into uh, surrealism is clearly going to be more of a, almost a purely idea-based investigation. But Professor Obama and I met him yesterday, and um, you know, he'd isolated certain um, ideas, certain, um, let's say, uh, hallmarks of, of surrealist uh, art and writing, and, and, and there were a number of them, but one obviously was, was juxtaposition, and really startling juxtaposition. And, and one methodology, or one, if that's a strategy, a tactic sometimes of search realists would be scale uh, scale confusion or scale juxtaposition. You know, a giant apple, an apple, a little room, I agree, or a little room around a giant apple, so on and so forth. Um, so that the, that scale shift, startling scale shift, becomes an architectural. You, know, you, you can follow that that path architecturally and, and see where it takes you. And, and there's a number of others, there's, there were five or six of them. So at the end of the day, he's still gonna be accountable to those ideas, to those, those surrealist positions or those surrealist investigations. And I'll say to all of you, you need to be honest about what you're accountable to because if, if I'm using an example, if an issue didn't want to be accountable of that and his design work, choose something else. Choose another topic. But 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 if someone has to repeat a thesis, or you know, someone has to, you don't get your great job, you know, go do great things in the world, it's usually because of one of two reasons. One, they're just woefully unfinished, just like they're just not done yet. And that's the more common one. But number two, sometimes it's kind of unfortunate, but it's, they have to kind of do the last part over again because they kind of were not accountable to the key parts of the research that, that they identify. You're identifying these key elements, your, your key standards. These standards, again, they can be very nebulous or they can be very precise, but you need to be accountable to what you identify are your key, you know, uh, ideas or standards that, that you're doing your design investigation in relation to. And, and so I think that's, that's very important. The accountability thing is, um, 
is a really interesting one. And as you say, it's, it's a linchpin that, that has a lot to do with whether something's called success or not. And, and, and a lot of that has to do with how you guys pose the nature of your challenge. And, and I'm thinking back to Garth, right. who did the healthcare and, and nature thing. You know, because sometimes you, you, po you pose the question as though it's a performance thesis, but there's no way you can prove it. There isn't a model to show that people will get well in his facility. So in his case, it was important that the nature of his exercise was, what kind of facility do you get when you take this issue having to do with architecture and healing, and you try to totally give it its head as a saturating decision driver in the scheme. What does that animal look like? And so what he was responsible for was to try to saturate a scheme with that issue. And that's what he tried it out and put on the wall. If he had said, my, my question is, I'll bet people will heal better in this facility if I design it this way, better than if they heal, better than if they convalesced in this facility. There's no way he could have delivered an answer to that. So that would have been posing the question as a performance thesis when there's no way he could be accountable to a performance answer. Right. And that's why the question that you pose is so tender. You want to pose it in a way where what you deliver can be defended and explained in some form. Mm -hmm. So that there is some form of accountability when you're done. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if you had conversations on this. Again, I think that this goes to, you know, whatever your, each of you are designing or whatever your application is, and if it's a, if it's a part of something or it's a whole building or it's a system or, 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 or whatever it is, just to make sure that um, it's better to take on, let's say, a design scope that's a little more limited, and you really, you know, do it in depth, and and your whatever illustrations, examples, design propositions that you generate and that you then document and present are very, are the best that you can do, are your best work for that scope you chose. And, and if it's your best work, I mean, you have to be honest with yourself, that's your best work, and then we get a true accurate picture of, of where you're at. And more often than not, because you guys are all in the professional programs and the master program, when you do your best work of that, it's going to be fine. What often happens again is um, the design is, is kind of thrown together, quite frankly. So often, and, and this is one reason that we were trying to do some things, different things a little differently this year, especially to our next year. You know, the design professors, the, the professors will look at the students' work, and, and we know these are all good students, and we'll go, well, God, you know, their, their work in fourth year was better than this. <laughs> or their project in, you know, this other class they had, um, maybe last year's graduate studio, second semester graduate studio was better than this one. Um, and so that's just a thing of, of you managing that process so you don't allow that to happen. And, uh, and, that, and that's difficult because you're doing all these other things. So um, I think that comes down to one, starting sooner, and two, limiting the scope in such a way that whatever you choose is you know, really thoughtfully done, that, that you really have put your, your best effort out there. And you're not scrambling to just get you know, 50 or 60 percent of done on a big wide, wide scope. I mean, you, you can do a bigger, you know, larger scope and, and, and get where you want to, fine. That's, that's great. 
But uh, that is always, it seems to be a common thing. You're referring to the design discourse? I am. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I know that's a different thing to different people, but, but whatever it is. And, and I say for every past thesis in, 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 in the last five years, but it's a, uh, it's a more common trend. I mean, the thesis still may be great, you know, very thoughtful, well done, graduate, great. But more often than not, um, and the students say it themselves, a lot of students will say, well, you know, I felt like my thesis design just really wasn't my best work. You know, I wish I could do it over again or something like that. And the truth is, you want to do it over again. <laughs> you know, you pass it. You're, you're on to the next thing, you know, as, as you should be. You're trying to get a job or you're, 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 you're doing whatever you're doing. Uh, so just try to, now's the time for you to take a hard look, and you may have already done this, at, at what you're doing and the scope of it and, and when you're going to really get into it. Because you know how design is. You have to go through a few iterations uh, before you, you really get something that's uh, thoughtful and, and connected with your research. It just doesn't happen instantly, usually. It's a process. Yeah, I think there's a there's another piece of that that's that's interesting for me to to reflect on, and that is that because we're architects and designers, we have a more finely honed most of us anyway have a more finely honed sense of value and virtue and goodness and success in architectural terms than we do in scholarship terms. Mm -hmm. um, and unless your chair is balanced and is going to push you on both the research and writing side and on the design side, um, it's, it's easy to have done uh, the kind of reading and thinking and writing and logicking things together, building your argument, showing your in-depth scholarship and pushing into your issues, mm -hmm. it's easy for that to have flaws in it that are never spotted mm -hmm. because most people are not going to sit down and read it word for word. Right. Uh, but that's another realm of flaw or success and that's what Craig's saying here, you've got to be strong on both counts. Mm -hmm. And I think most faculty would agree if your scholarship is flawed, your harvesting will be flawed mm -hmm. and your translation into architecture will be flawed. If, you're, if your scholarship is in depth, you really wring every piece of wisdom out of your issue that you can and you're good at transforming it into form, then you've got tight fit all the way along and that's really what we're trying to do. I like those words, harvesting and translation, that you were using. Um, yeah. And really, I guess between those two, there's kind of a, a, a a selecting or a, uh, a culling, a winnowing down from the harvesting. Would be a good word from that. For that, maybe. Uh, yeah. Maybe spell that. <laughs> you know, harvesting, winnowing. You know, paring down to the essentials, translating. And uh, a good example of that yeah. would be the surrealism. Right. You know, Tanisio chooses juxtaposition as the one nugget out of surrealism, and then that balloons into an investigation of juxtaposition. Right, right, right. This is how the ballooning kind of starts, or there's a lot of ways it starts, but then it needs to 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 expand. Once you like, once you kind of focus down, then you need to start that expansion. And maybe some of you are doing that now. Maybe you'll do it soon. But I wouldn't wait until <coughs> January to do that. I would start. I don't know what their schedule is, but I would, I would do that sometime the second half of this semester. I would really um, get, get into that. Let's see what's something else. Um, oh, think of what you said about, uh, you know, you, you have your, your, your big document, you, you've written all these things, and your committee reads it, or your chair reads it. But um, 
another thing, this is just an obvious common sense thing, but I've seen, uh, and being the chair out of lots of committees of some really good students, you know, some students are able to take out the key uh, words, thoughts, processes, the key ideas, and, and couple them in their final defense or final presentation and couple them really well with their, their, their testing, their application, their, their design, uh, you know, investigation. And one really sets up the other. Um, and, and those ideas or that, those key aspects of the research are, are like really clear, you know, if you, the project's up on the wall here, or the slides, you know, it's, it's kind of front and center. It's not, you know, the, the reviewers aren't trying to figure out, well, what did, what did you research, you know? What did, what did you identify as kind of your, your touchstones, your, your guiding, uh, uh, you know, key elements that are informing this work? Um, make, make that real clear, you know, make that, uh, and, and as you go forward, you're gonna start, if you, if you have, you know, 80 pages of writing, I don't know what they have these days, you know, take that by 11, you know, what are the 10 most essential, or six most essential pages of information of that? And then you start building from this side, from the design discourse, so that's that, where you're gonna take the, the essential, you know, the real core of this and bring it over here and you're going to start to investigate that through a design process methodology. And that's where they join. And that's where they begin to really inform each other. And then you still you know, can package some of these things separately, but, but they'll become an integrated whole. And then, then it's a design thesis, a uh, design-based thesis. Not, you know, and, and this is fine just to do a, a research on some interesting topics, but to me, you know, I feel pretty strongly about this. I think we share this view. You. Um, you know, this is an architectural professional degree. This is not a. This was a post-professional degree. This was a architecture and uh, an MR in science. Whether it be an art, be a master's of science in architecture. I mean, you guys may go get your degree, get licensed, practice for a while, and you get, really get into something about. Who knows what? Some some topic that you want to research, you get a funded from some grant to study something for a couple of years. That's a post-professional degree. You can come back and do a, a, a thesis that's purely scientific based or purely idea based or you know purely whatever. Uh, that's great, but but this is an MR. This is a professional design degree. So I, I feel real strong that this would be a design thesis. I mean, fat I can use on that. <laughs> but but I, I feel that it's 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 a it's a it's a good mark, not a not a master's of science. So. I need to wrap up. Thanks, Greg. Yes, Greg. Appreciate it. All right, see you all on Friday.